Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, I'm Don. I'm an alcoholic, and I am delighted uh, to be here this weekend with everybody, and uh I got to tell you, you know, I'm um, I'm not a circuit speaker. <laughs> I'm a meat and potatoes AA guy. I go to a lot of AA meetings. I sponsor men. Uh, I'm a guy that's overpaid uh, because of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You need to know that right up in front. Uh, I think it's an honor and a privilege just to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, just to be able to go to meetings on a regular basis with people like you, uh, be able to enjoy the gift of sobriety one more day. A gift that for a long time I didn't think I wanted. And then once I wanted it, I knew I'd never make it in Alcoholics Anonymous. Not in a million years. It's not going to happen for a guy like me. Because I had tried everything I could think of before I came to AA to put down the drink. And I got to tell you, for a guy like me, putting down the drink isn't the trick. You know, Unfortunately, I'm a one-trick pony. That's all I can do. I can put the drink down and I'll start walking away from it. And I'll think I'm doing pretty good. And the day goes by, and I go, yeah, I don't know what that drinking was about. And a couple of days go by, and I go, yeah, well, I don't know why I drank like that for so long. And then it's like one day I just wake up, and I start thinking new thoughts about putting down that drink. Like, you know, I bet I'm the only guy that can't drink tonight. You know, I bet I'm the only. You know, I've made too much of this thing. Because there's something about living life on life's terms, day in, day out, being good, that eventually it's just too much work for a guy like me. And I always pick up that drink. And when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous this time, September 16th, 1991, I absolutely knew I wasn't going to stay sober. Not in a million years. And I got to tell you, it doesn't matter how you get here, and it doesn't matter about your attitude when you get here. What matters is what happens after you get here. And if you're new here tonight, I want to welcome you. And maybe somebody dragged you here. You know, maybe you're trying to pull a fast one. Maybe there's some heat on. I don't know. There was some heat on in my life. I was in a lot of trouble when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Imagine that. And, uh, you know, may, maybe you got, maybe you even got a sponsor to make them believe you're serious about this thing, which maybe you're not. And you're thinking, God, I got to go to that damn conference, you know, and if I don't go, they'll tell me I'm not sincere. And tell, so I'll just go to shut them up. And you've been listening to all these great speakers and you're, and you're fighting it. You know, I know what it's like to hear the message and fight it and not want that message to get in. I want to tell you you're welcome here. And i got to tell you, attitude doesn't matter. Motives don't matter. You're very welcome here. And I hope you find what I found here, which is a brand new life. Brand new life. And I want to thank Harlan for uh, extending that invitation to come out here and allowing me to bring my beautiful wife Eileen with me and treating us so good, and we've just had a great time. You know, he made the long and arduous journey south from Bellingham, Washington. <laughs> If you don't know where Bellingham is, we're about 30 miles south of the Canadian border. So uh, show a little respect. We're your first line of defense against the evil horde we call the Canadians. So when they cross the border, you'll be you'll be thanking Bellingham. And I got a lot of friends here tonight. And I got a lot of friends I've made over the years in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've made some new friends here. And I and the great thing about doing what I'm doing here tonight. He's having this wonderful young man adjust my microphone for me. Is he smart knowing you don't want me touching him? Trust me. Like I was saying. <laughs> now, where was it? Oh, yeah, about me. <laughs> Gee, that was tough to remember. See, I get to come to a thing like this, and I get to just be an AA member. I mean, I got like an hour and a half. That's it. An hour and a half where I got to put on a suit, you know, and I get a little nervous, and I go, geez, you know, I hope I don't blow it. They're nice people. I hope I get to say what's inside my heart. That's all I really want to do. I don't care if I'm entertaining or you think I'm funny or you think I got good recovery. I mean, whether I do or I don't doesn't really matter what I do here. It matters what I do when I go back home. It matters what I do tonight in the motel room with my wife. It matters what I do on the ride home. It matters what I do with those guys I sponsor doesn't matter. You don't know. I could just be a slick-talking salesman up here putting his best AA foot forward. You know, my life begins and ends with what I do when I'm not at this podium. But I get to come to these things, and I get to hear the talks I heard this weekend. I heard four outstanding talks so far. I mean, two unbelievable AA talks and two unbelievable Al-Anon talks. 
I mean, you would be hard-pressed to find four talks better than the ones we've heard this weekend so far. You would have to go long and hard and look really deep to find four better talks than that. I want you to keep this in mind tonight as I start. Four out of five ain't bad. It just really isn't, you know. I'm going to share with you tonight in a general way what I used to be like, what happened, and what I'm like now. I'm going to talk to you about what happened with me with my alcoholism and what happened to me with the program of recovery known as Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, uh, I don't know if I was born alcoholic. You know, there's a lot of new evidence that there's definitely an alcoholic gene. Cliff R. likes to talk about the alcoholic chromosomes right there and then the end of the stream going, hey, what's going on, you know, and, and I don't know any of that. I don't know if I was born alcoholic, but I'll tell you what, you know, I had all the tendencies growing up, you know. I was a kind of goofy little kid, totally self-obsessed. Selfishness and self-centeredness, that's the root of my problem. And I got that long before I take a drink. I'm natural. I'm the kind of guy that knows how I look in 17 different angles at all times. I, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. I'm the kind of self-obsessed alcoholic that I'll get you in a corner talk incessantly about myself for a half an hour straight, realize I'm doing that, stop and go, wait a minute, that's enough about me. What do you think of me? And I don't <laughs> and I don't have to work on these things. They come naturally to me. And you need to understand this. These are not things that are produced by me consuming alcohol. This self-obsession, this feeling like I don't know where I fit in, this invisible wall that always has seemed to be up between me and the rest of the world. I can see you, I can hear you, but I can't touch you. And even if you love me and you say the right things, there's something inside me that doesn't let it in, something that won't allow me to believe it. And these are things that are taken care of by the consumption of alcohol. Because when I drink alcohol, as much as anything, it transports me. It takes me to the land of I don't care, and I get to step out easy, and the rough edges become smooth, and I get to feel like I join you. I get to feel like whatever was between us, whatever was keeping me from connecting with you, now just magically dissolves. And I can feel you, and I can hear you, and I can love you, and I can receive that coming back from me. And that's powerful stuff for a guy that's growing up and doesn't have anything to compare it to as I'm coming up. When you're a young man, right away, and everybody knows this, they lay out they lay out a plan for you. Society will tell you, if you do these certain things and you do them well, you're going to have a great life. You're going to be fulfilled. You're going to be uplifted. You're going to have a life of love and hope. It's going to be terrific. And I took that plan and I did everything they suggested I do. I went to the right schools and I played the right sports and I dated the right girls. And I got to tell you, I excelled at all of it. I did great. And a funny thing happened. The guys I was doing that stuff with, they were fulfilled. And they did have that experience of love and acceptance and fulfillment. But for me, all those things that society tells me, if I do them and I do them well, they will leave me feeling fulfilled, leave me feeling strangely hollow, like an itch I can't scratch. And I know there's something wrong with me, and I can't put my finger on it. I always knew there was something wrong with me. And I did my first inventory, and I used to sit with my sponsor, and he talked about the outstanding characteristic of alcoholics is we take those same actions expecting different results time and time again. And I do my first inventory, and I had a sponsor that believed in taking it all the way back as far as you can remember and looking for the patterns and talk about what happened when you were growing up and talk about all that stuff and get it on paper. And get those old resentments out that you're trying to say that you're over, that are really dominating your life, even in early sobriety. And when I wrote that inventory, I saw the first event where it was clear to me that I always took the same actions, expecting different results. And for me, that happened the first time long before I started drinking, five years old. Five years old, I'm not a drunk. I'm a goofy little self-obsessed kid sitting on my butt in the sewing room playing with a bobby pin. And I looked to my right, and there was an electrical outlet. Ooh. And I thought to myself, looks like it'll fit. And I went, Bam! And I got shot across the room, and my fingers were smoking, and my hair was standing straight up. And I remember thinking, did that just happen? Did that hurt as bad as I think it did? Bam! <laughs> now, Based on the way that I lived my life until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I guarantee you I would have went for three, but I was unconscious. That was the only, the only thing that stopped me. And that's how I lived my life. I don't learn from pain. I adjust to pain. I get comfortable with pain. I make concessions to pain. I wish that the pain I experience as a result of what I do when I drink is some stimuli to me to change. It doesn't seem to be. And I'm goofy and I got nothing to compare it to. And I'm coming up and I'm excelling at sports and I'm getting the good grades. 
and I'm just uncomfortable in my own skin, and I'm trying to be a good kid, and I know there's something wrong with me, and I don't have to come to Alcoholics Anonymous to learn to do a 10th and 11th step. I do that naturally every night when I go to bed. I'm filled with remorse. I'm filled with regret. I think about all the things I should have said, and I should have done it this way, and I should have done it that way. No comfort in my own skin. I'm either a step ahead or a step behind. I just don't feel like I fit in, and I got nothing to compare it to until I'm 17 years old and I throw my first drunk. Now, that's not my first drink, and I got to tell you, I'm really not interested in when I had my first drink. I mean, I'm sure I had a little sip of beer here and there as a kid growing up. Maybe I had a glass of wine at somebody's christening. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about getting drunk. I'm talking about when you get enough alcohol in you in one setting to get there. And for me, that happened when I was 17. I went out with the guys who played high school basketball with, and what was on tap that night was Old English 800. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a fine malt beverage if there ever was one. <laughs> It'll get you done. Get her done. Yeah. And I wasn't drinking to get drunk. I was drinking to fit in. I was, a t I was taking actions once again in my life just to fit in, man. I just want to fit in. I just want to be a part of. I feel so uncomfortable. Yeah, you're telling me I'm great. You're telling me you care about me. Dude, you don't understand. I, I can't feel that stuff. I don't know what's wrong with me. And I got to hide it. I got to do it with smoke and mirrors, you know. I don't know how to express what I'm feeling inside. I just want to fit in. And I drink that first can of Old English, and I drink that second can. And something happened between the <laughs> beginning of that second can and the end of that second can. And I'm telling you, a feeling came over me, and it filled me from my toes to my head, from the inside out. And in that moment, everything about my life changed. But standing right there in front of me with the guys I play ball with, nothing changed. These are the guys I play ball with. I like them a lot. But suddenly, I looked at them. And you know what? I love these guys. I got all emotional. I started telling them about it. I love you guys. We're going to be together forever. I mean it. You're the best. And I just started turning this big, sensitive goober and... I'm listening to that rock and roll come out of that rickety car stereo that we drove up to Lake Hollywood in, and we're up here, and we're standing up in the top of this bluff, and we're looking down at this concrete pond in Hollywood, California, where I was born and raised, and I'm listening to the music, and it's perfect. It's the greatest song I've ever heard. I wouldn't have changed the song for a minute. I just couldn't believe it. And I don't know what's happening to me. I have no understanding of the f effect of alcohol in my system at that time, but everything's getting better, and it's getting better fast. And I look down and the sun getting low and it's shimmering on that concrete pond down there. And I'm telling you, I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life. And then I had an experience that I've had from the moment I drink drunk to the day I stopped drinking drunk was when I start to drink, I start to think. And I come up with outstanding ideas. And I do this with no help, no outside intervention, no research, no sponsorship. I just get them. And they're perfect. Like, I've got to get down to that water. And we're up on this hill, and it's about a 45-degree grade down to that. And I start down that hill, and I'm walking kind of fast. And then I'm kind of jogging. And then I'm kind of running, and my legs are windmilling behind my ears. And then I fell, and it was like sky, earth, sky, earth, sky, earth, all the way down. And I slammed into this oak tree. Bam! And I'm an athlete. And athletes understand things probably quicker than people that aren't athletes. And when you... When I made that contact with that oak tree, I knew because of my athletic background, I'm going to be really hurt. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I got up slowly from that oak tree, and I realized, no pain. You see, it's my first drunk, and I'm already gathering valuable information about the consumption of alcohol that's going to serve me for the rest of my drinking career. If you drink enough alcohol, there's no pain. You know, you guys that are in the gym, you're lifting the weight, and you got that expression, no pain, no gain. I have my own expression. No pain, no pain. <laughs> I love that. And it's, it begins the salad days of my drinking, the drinking without trouble days of my drinking, the when it was working drinking. You know, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, it seemed to be an additive to an already full life. You know, I played ball, and I dated a lot, and I started in the business, and I started going up the ladder, and I'm telling you, I didn't have any problem. I wasn't really picking up a tab. You know what I mean? It wasn't really getting in any real trouble. I wasn't standing in courtrooms in front of judges trying to explain my latest event of outrageous behavior. I didn't have my mom standing in front of me crying her eyes out saying, don't you know you're killing yourself? I didn't have girlfriends hiding in closets because they're afraid they're going to get smacked around in my latest drunken rage. 
I guess we can take all of those things and label them yet to be added to my story. But in the early part of my drinking, I was having a wonderful time with it. When I was 23 years old, I was tearing it up from both ends. I was working hard, making a lot of money, drinking drunk on a daily basis, doing a lot of other outside issues, and it was wonderful. I had so much fun with it. And I'm telling you, if I was sitting in the bar knocking them back and God, God Almighty had knocked into the, walked into the bar, sat down on the bar stool next to me and said, Don, the next drink, the next one, it's going to pass you into a region where there's no return through human aid. You're going to have to go to Alcoholics Anonymous for the rest of your life or die a horrible alcoholic death. I'd have told God Almighty, you got the wrong guy because it's working for me. It's filling me from the inside out, from my toes to my head. It's letting me be anything I want to be. It's allowing me not to feel anything I don't want to feel. It allows me to create my reality. Norm A. used to talk about falling in love with a synthetic existence. And the minute I heard that, I knew what he was talking about. Because I get to create my own reality. If I don't like what I'm feeling, just take another drink. If I don't like the way you're treating me, I can walk away from you. And I don't have to feel that emotional tap. I'm cutting you out of my life. And I don't know that this is happening to me. And when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I would hear men tell they're drunk a lot, and they always talked about at a certain point in their drinking, they cross the line. They cross the line from controlled to uncontrolled drinking. And they always got dramatic, and then I crossed the line. Dun, 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 you know. And when I got here, I wanted to know when it happened to me. It sounded like you needed to figure that out, you know. And I thought of all the dramatic things, you know. Was it that first car crash I got into? Or maybe it was that last car crash. First time I made my mom cry behind my drinking, last time I made my mom cry. First trip to jail, last trip to jail. Always looking for the dramatic stuff. But the truth is, when I crossed the line from controlled to uncontrolled drinking, when King Alcohol took possession of my soul, was when I thought it was working for me. When I would have told anybody that will listen, I will never stop doing this, why would you? It's so much fun. And you need to hear this. It doesn't. <laughs> this doesn't mean that my drinking isn't a problem for the people around me. <laughs> I mean, I'm 23 years old, and they start showing up in my life, and you've all had them in your life. You know who they are. They're the well-meaning people. And the... The well-meaning people are family members and their husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends and employers and best friends and uh, arresting officers and uh, district attorneys and uh, doctors that are stitching you up and you don't feel the needle and they think that's kind of weird. And, and they started showing up in my life and they started talking to me about my drinking. And they weren't belligerent. They weren't mean. They'd say things like, you seem like a nice guy. You seem like you got a little potential. Have you ever thought about looking at your drinking, maybe slowing down? Maybe quitting? And I just said, no. Never occurred to me. Just thought they had the wrong guy. You see, I wish that the pain other people experience, both emotional and physical, of the result of the actions I take when I drink, is some stimuli to me to change. But it's not. You see, it's not a problem for me until it's a problem for me. I can't tell you how many times I had a girlfriend standing in front of me, crying her eyes out, going, don't you know how I feel? And I'd be like... Not really. Because <laughs> I'm drinking. And you're watching. And one's more fun than the other. <laughs> and that's what alcohol allows me to do. You see, in my system, I can't form a true partnership with another human being. You see, I don't even understand that that's not a choice anymore. I think I choose to be this lone wolf. I choose to be able to shed my skin very easily. I choose to be able to change friends like other people change socks and change relationships like other people change socks. I think this is a decision that I'm making. I don't understand that not only have I lost the power of choice where the drink is concerned, that I've lost the power of choice in my life, that my life has become unmanageable, and that I don't have these choices anymore. I don't get to hurt my mother and say that I'm sorry and I'm never going to do it again and then follow that up with action. I don't get to change that. I think I have the power to do that, but when I hurt her again, I'm confused and I'm baffled and I don't know how to explain that to her. And I don't understand the trouble I'm in. I don't know what I really suffer from. And I'm singing my song and I'm having to sing it a little bit louder as time goes by and my song sounds something like this. When, it, when it's a problem for me, I'll knock it off. If you watched your own self, you wouldn't have to watch me. And I'm getting a little bit belligerent. I'm getting a little bit of that denial up. And I'm starting to feel the heat. And it's coming in from a lot of different directions. And I think they got the wrong guy. But I'll tell you what. By the time I was 25 years old, the light went on. Every negative aspect of my life, every heartache, every failure, every plan I put into action and failed to hit the finish line, right alongside that was a drink of alcohol. I got it. It's the booze. 
All these years they've been talking to me about my drinking, and I just thought they had the wrong guy. And you know what? They're right. The booze is killing me. And I had, for the first time at 25 years old, what our big book refers to as self-knowledge, where they're not telling you, where mom's not telling you you got a problem, or your husband's not telling you you got a problem, and the job's not telling you you got a problem, and the court system's not telling you you got a problem. In the quiet of your room, late at night, with the stillness of your thoughts, chewing on your brain, you know you've got a problem with the drink, and that's called self-knowledge. No justification, no rationalization. But I hadn't been to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I hadn't read your big book. And I certainly hadn't got to the part in the book that says, for the real alcoholic, he will absolutely be unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. And that's just crazy, isn't it? <laughs> you know why? Because I'm a man. And you know what a man does when he finds out he has a problem with something? You just knock it off, don't you? Just knock it off. And when I had that self-realization, when I had that self-knowledge that the drink was killing me, I did what most of us do the first time we have that information. I made the declaration. Told everybody I knew, I'm quitting drinking, so don't try to tempt me. Called up my narcotic salesman of record and said, don't sell me anything, no matter how bad I beg. <laughs> Because they're a reputable, honorable sort, they won't sell you anything if you ask them not to. Well, I know, Don, I can't take your $500. You made me promise. <laughs> and I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't get a sponsor. And I didn't work your 12 golden steps wrapped in a ribbon of promise. And I didn't get commitments, and I didn't get service work under my belt, and I didn't set up, and I didn't clean up, and I didn't make coffee, and I didn't talk to the newcomer, and I didn't read your silly book, and I quit drinking for two weeks. <laughs> and the funny thing about that two weeks is the outside stuff that they can see, you know, it starts looking better, doesn't it? I mean, the laundry starts getting done. I start showing up to work five days a week, which was kind of new for me back at that period of my life. And I'm getting all the affirmation and all the attaboys that you think a guy would want to receive who just made a life-changing decision, which is I'm giving up the booze. And they're saying all the right things. They're saying, we love you. We're so glad you quit drinking. We thought you were going to die. It's all going to be okay, Don. And man, I want to believe that, you know. And I'm parroting that stuff back to them and I'm paraphrasing it. Yeah, thanks so much for hanging in there with me. I don't know what all that was about. I don't miss it at all. You know, I'm working out again. Work's going a lot better. Everything's going to be great. But in here where my soul lives, with every day that goes by since my last drunk, I'm getting more irritable, restless, and discontent. And confused and baffled. Because for years you've been telling me that drinking's my problem. You know what? I agree with you. And I'm not drinking. So does anybody want to explain to me why I want to kill myself or kill somebody else? Does anybody want to explain to me why I'm waking up in terror every morning? And I haven't had a drink in 10 days, 11 days, 12 days, 13 days. And I'm starting to go crazy in my skin, and I'm not drinking? You got something for that? And I'm a tough guy, and I don't know how to ask for help, and I'm a nonconformist, and I hide behind that shield of nonconformity and fear, and I do it with smoke and mirrors, and I can't ask for help, and I just go crazy in a short two weeks sober under my own program of recovery. And I have what the big book refers to as the thought that precedes the first drink. For me, it always sounds like this. You know, I've been good. Two weeks is an unusually long time for a guy like me to go without a drink. And I'm not, I'm not going to buy any drugs, and I'm not going to go to the bar. I'm, I'm going to get a half pint. What's in a half pint? My God, a half pint couldn't hurt anybody. And I go and I drink that half pint. And the relief that it produces within me is so precise, so concise, so where have you been all my life? So why did I think quitting drinking was a good idea that I make a decision that I'm going to figure out a way to go through this thing called life without giving up the booze completely? And it starts. You see, in the doctor's opinion, it says guys like me drink essentially for the effect produced by alcohol. And the effect for me has always been, in a word, relief. It's for relief of what swirls around inside my head. And i got to tell you this. What swirled around in my head before I started drinking might have been bad and it might have been uncomfortable and I might have felt out of step. But I'll tell you what, five or six years of heavy drinking into my story, what swirled around in my head when I quit drinking was completely different. It was nightmarish. It was terror-filled. It was completely fear-based. There was a time when I was a young man, as crazy as I was and as uncomfortable as I was, where I could go out and I could play ball and I could feel the grass under my feet and I could race across the field with my buddies and I didn't need anything to be happy. 
I needed sun on my face and a few extra hours with my friends, and I didn't need money. I didn't need property. I didn't need prestige. I didn't need to be liked. I just was glad to be alive. There was something about life that just was enough. And I had lost that somewhere along that five to six years of heavy drinking. Because now I need something. I need something so much more. The hole is so much larger in me than when I first started drinking. You see, the alcohol that I was pouring down inside me that I thought was filling that hole was actually making that hole bigger. And it took more and more booze to fill the very hole that kept widening and widening as I poured the whiskey in there. And I didn't know that. You see, I think I have a moral problem. I think I have a problem of self-control. I have no idea that I suffer from disease, and it's twofold. I've got an obsession of the mind, and it doesn't matter how many times I go to jail, how many cars I wreck, how many women I make cry, how many times I break my mother's heart. It doesn't matter. All the self-knowledge in the world won't keep me from the next drink because I've got a brain in light of all that good information, that information that says I cannot drink, I will have a brain that will tell me it will be different this time, and this is why. And then I get the second part of our wonderful disease because I never go out to wreck the car, go to jail, hurt somebody's feelings. I drink because I'm surrendering to an obsession of the mind greater than my understanding. I don't have the power to combat that obsession of the mind. And I surrender to that and don't even know that I'm doing it. I think it's a choice. I think I'm choosing to drink every time I go back to it. And I pick up that alcohol and I put it in my system and the phenomenon of craving kicks in. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to drink till the well is dry. It means that I just don't know what's going to happen. Maybe I wake up drunk on the couch in the morning and maybe I wake up drunk in Tijuana. It's anybody's guess. I don't know what's going to happen. And the Odyssey began at 25 years old, and it lasted six years before I made it to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's a lot of the stuff you read about in Chapter 3. Various vain attempts to control and enjoy my drinking. The great obsession. Someday, somehow, I'll figure out how to control and enjoy my drinking. And you know what? I can enjoy my drinking, but I can't control it. And I can control my drinking, but I don't enjoy it. I mean, normal people don't go out to the bar and have the two-beer, two-shot rule, you know? I'm going to have two beers and two shots, and then I'm leaving. And when I do that, I guess what? I don't get in any trouble, but I don't have any fun either. But then you take the two-beer, two-shot rule off, man, we have some fun, but, you know, going to jail ain't all that. <laughs> and all the trouble that wasn't in my place at, in my life at age 23 starts getting let in. And it's one piece of trouble at a time. See, the wonderful thing about alcohol, if you start, if I had thrown my first drunk and all hell broke loose, maybe that would have caught my attention. But I waltzed away from all the things worth, worthwhile in life. I slowly walked away from them. And King Alcohol took them all very slowly and very seductively. And I turned all those things in without a fight. I turned in all the things to King Alcohol that money can't buy. I turned in that love of family, that love of life, figuring that maybe things are going to be okay. I had lost all hope. And I did that willingly. I'm not a victim in this. And I moved to Boston, Massachusetts in 85 and uh, figured L.A. was the problem. All my loady friends are in L.A. How's a guy going to get sober with all those loady people around? And where I built that reputation is Johnny Saturday night. And, <laughs> and I moved to Boston because it's all going to be different there. And much, much to my surprise, I found out they drink in Boston. and uh, They drink a lot in Boston. And I stayed for there for three years till I wore out my welcome. Boston was interesting, you know. It was the first time I didn't have any real friends around. I was away from my family. And a lot of things started getting added in my story. I started to get violent for no reason. The frustration of my life, the failure of my life started to heap up on me. And then when I threw whiskey on top of that, the whiskey I was looking for, the relief, the whiskey that used to make me laugh and feel like my friends were closer, now made me sour. It made me angry. And I started getting in a lot of trouble. I started going to jail. And it's amazing through repetition and exposure, the things that I got used to in my drinking, things that the first time they happened to me, they were just appalling. I mean, the first time I came out of a blackout and I was in a jail cell, I was shocked. And I thought, I'm not this guy, man. I got a good job. I got a bright future. This is crazy. What am I doing in jail? This is never going to happen again. But I'll tell you what, the 10th time you come out of a blackout and you're in a jail cell, it's very different. You're like, well... I'm in jail. I don't know which jail exactly. And you start wondering what kind of trouble you're in and what you did. And I don't know what I suffer from. I still th keep thinking that if I can just figure it out, if I can just figure it out, if I can just exert my place, get the right job, get the right woman, it's all going to work out. And I move back to L L.A. and I get the best job I ever had in my life. And I lie to the guy who hires me because I got this reputation in the industry that I worked in. And everybody knows I'm a drunk. 
And he said, what's going on with your drinking these days? I said, oh, man, it's nothing. You know, not a big deal. I have a couple of beers in the weekend. And they hire me in this job. And I got to tell you, I was there for six months before anything changed. And in the first six months, I did a tremendous job for this company. I mean, I did tremendous work for them. They couldn't have been happier. And then the owner of the company made a, he made a grievous error with an alcoholic of my type. He came up to me one day, and he put his arm around me like he you put your arm around your buddy. He said, Don, I want you to know something. I'm really proud of you. You've done a great job. Now, that might have been what he said, but what I heard was, Don, you've done a great job. You really need to slack off. <laughs> and that's what my head hears when somebody tells me something like that. And I thought the heat's off. They're not looking at me. And my behavior starts getting tuned up again. And I start missing work again. And I start showing up with booze on my breath. And I start showing up drunk. And they're talking to me about my drinking. And something happened in January 91 that probably had to happen for a guy like me to finally start lowering that wall of denial. What happened for me is a boss called me in his office. He said, you're fired. And that wasn't unusual. I've been fired lots of times. I get fired in for the fight I get in with the salesman. I get fired for a lot of different things. They love to fire me for attendance. But nobody ever fired me for this reason. He looked me in the eye and he said, you're fired for your drinking. You're a drunk. It's never going to stop. We talked to you about it. Get out. And I'd love to tell you that I heard that and it broke me down and I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. But I'm an alcoholic. And our 12 and 12 says my outstanding characteristic is defiance. And I got the alcoholic bluster up. How dare you? <laughs> After all I've done for you. And the other thing is, you see, I'm a pessimist and I'm a victim, which means the glass is always half empty and it's your fault. And anything negative that always, ever happens in my life, I will not take responsibility for. And I just played the victim card. I called up my sister in Simi Valley, California, and I said, Pat, they done me wrong. They fired me after all I've done for them. Can you believe it? And I said, I, got, I need a place to get on my feet. Can I come stay at your house? And my sister said, yeah, you know what, Don, you can come stay with me. But if you drink, you're out of my house. And I told my older sister, who I love as much as any person on this planet, Pat, I won't drink. I promise. Because I can lie to the Pope by this time when my drink is concerned. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. And I lived in that house for eight months until I got sober, and I drank every day in that house. And if you don't know how you do that when they're watching you, well, maybe you're not a sneaky rat like I am. Uh, I got no problem drinking around your schedule. I'm unemployed. <laughs> What time do you go to work in the morning? 7 a.m.? Bar is open. But you need to hear this. At the end of my drink, and I'm not drinking so my family means something to me or my friends mean something to me or I think I can kid myself I dance better or I'm better looking than I really am. I'm doing oblivion drinking. I'm doing light switch drinking. I'm getting the whiskey on board hard enough and fast enough to shut off the head so I can get drunk, so I can go into a blackout, so I can pass out in this room I'm mooching off of my sister in Simi Valley, California. So I can come out of that blackout to meet the hideous four horsemen sitting on the end of the bed. Terror, frustration, bewilderment, despair. They sat there and they watched me pass out. And the minute I woke up, they talked to me in my own voice. And they talked to me about my life. And they say things like, who are you going to hurt today, Don? Who are you going to rip off today, Don? What are you going to do to get drunk today, Don? And I don't know what you do with a head like that at 6.30 in the morning with a hangover, but I just took another pull from the jug. And I swore it was going to go down that way. Years before this period of my life, I had already made a surrender. And it's not the kind of surrender we ask the new man to make when he walks in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had made a complete and utter surrender to King Alcohol. I said, I'm a drunk. Some people are, I guess. And this thing's eventually going to kill me. So let's try to reduce the losses. Let's stop driving. Let's stop going out. Let's stop working. Let's stop caring. And my life got smaller and smaller and smaller as I tried to defend and protect my right to drink. And I'd have those vain attempts to control and enjoy my drinking or those insidious ego-based things where I thought maybe this time it'd be different and I'd actually stop drinking for a week or a couple of weeks. And then the terror would be so strong, I'd go back to the drink and thinking, yeah, that's not going to happen. And I surrendered. I surrendered to the fact that I'm a drunk and I'm going to die from the drink. And I knew that was going to happen. The month I got sober, I got an unemployment check. I went up to my brother-in-law and I said, Larry, I got my check. I need to borrow your car and go cash it. And he asked me a very unusual question. He said, Don, will you be coming back? <laughs> and the reason he asked me that, I kind of borrowed his car a few times that summer and gone out on little vacations, we'll call them. And, uh, and I'm an alcoholic. I got right in Larry's face. Larry, how dare you? I can't believe you just said that to me. You know, the last time this happened, I opened my heart to you. I apologized to you. I told you how sorry I was. 
And here you are giving me a hard time. I'm just trying to cash my check. And the normies, that works with them. They just back right up. Hey, I'm sorry. You're right. Here's the keys. And I'm so grandiose, I remember taking the keys out of his hands and thinking, yeah, that's right, and there better be gas in it, because that's just the way I am. I take my unemployment check, and I go down to the local liquor store, because that's where alcoholics of my type cash are unemployment checks. And I'm waiting to cash the check, and I have what the book talks about, the thought that precedes the first drink, what's in a half pint. I cash the check, and I get a half pint, and I drink the half pint, and the half pint gets lonely, so we drink another half pint, and I have the thought, you know, I can be to the valley and back in 45 minutes, and I'm gone. Three days later, I'm driving up the hill to face that family I'd done over one more time. One more time, I've taken their hope, their faith, and their trust, and I've torn it to shreds. And you need to hear this, driving up the hill to face that family I'd done over one more time, I love them no less than I love them at this very moment. And I love my family tremendously, you see, but I got a problem. I can't serve two masters. I only got time to serve one. And that's king alcohol. And if you get between me and a drink, it's nothing personal. It's almost business-like. I'm getting to the drink. I'm going around you. I'm going through you. I'm manipulating you. I'm telling you what you want to hear. But bet your bottom dollar, I'm getting to the drink. But I know nothing of alcoholism. I don't have the vocabulary to explain that to my family. So I say things like, I'm so sorry. God, I love you. I don't know why I do this. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't mean to stay away that long. I didn't mean to take the car. It just got away from me. Can you give me another chance? And it got really hard for my family to believe those sweet apologies and those sweet promises when I kept roaring through their life year after year after year, and it kept, got worse. It got worse. It never got better. I walk into that house to face the music, and I find out my brother-in-law wanted to report the car stolen, that my sister is negotiating him down to a missing persons report. <laughs> and they called the Simi Valley Police, and they're on their way up to do the follow-up work. Now, I don't know if you've ever been up for three days drinking and doing other things, but the police usually aren't who you want to talk to. I got warrants for my arrest in two counties, so I start yelling at my sister. I got warrants. I'm going to jail. Thanks a lot, because now it's her fault. <laughs> I go outside of the house to wait for the police because I don't want the interview to go on in front of the family because I have no idea what I'm going to be saying, but uh, I'm fairly certain I'm going to be lying. <laughs> and the black and white cruiser pulls up, and on the side of the cruiser it says, Canine Unit. And I think, great, they brought the dog. <laughs> like I'm in any shape to make a run for it. And a cop gets out, and he cocks over to me, and he starts asking me those hard, tough questions. Like, you're, you're a trained professional. Like, where were you? And... uh most of what I remember is illegal, so I'm making up a story about a bachelor party that got out of control. And he starts looking at my eyes really hard because they're like bloodshot. They're like Chinese roadmaps rolling up in my head. And he's looking at me, and I pick that vibe up, and I break. And he breaks over with me, and then we break over here. And pretty soon we're talking, and my hands are getting wet, and I'm nervous, and I just want to distract his attention. I see the dog in the back seat, and I go, hey, is that your partner? He goes, well, yes, it is. And he walks over, and he opens the back door, and this dog gets out, German Shepherd, not a hair out of place, like a Rin Tin Tin reincarnate, you know. <laughs> and with no prompting on my part, he starts to relay facts to me about the dog's life. The dog is three years past mandatory retirement. He can't retire him. He's too good. The dog has participated in more arrests than any dog in the history of Ventura County. The dog has participated in more arrests and rescues than any dog in the history of Ventura or Los Angeles County. This dog was so phenomenal that the officers took a collection out of pocket to send him over to Europe for international competition where he kicked butt on German German shepherds. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and I said to the cop, I go, it's a phenomenal dog you have there, sir. And about that moment, this thought flew in the back of my mind, the kind of thought, the minute you think it, you know it's the truth. You may want to deny it with every fiber in your being, but you know it's the truth. And what the truth was, was this dog had done significantly more with his life than I'd done with mine. <laughs> God, I hated that dog. You know, it's very funny. I told my wife that story when I was courting, you know, because that's what alcoholics do. We court, we tell the most embarrassing parts of our story. Hey, top this. <laughs> that or we play whose family's worse. We do that too. 
I told my wife the story about the dog. She said, yeah, the dog had a tag on his collar, and it said, winner, and your tag said, loser. You know? So I married her. <laughs> Love like that's hard to find. And I'd love to tell you I had some spiritual epiphany, that that was my spiritual bottom, and I said, you know what? That's it. I can't take it anymore. I better get down to that A and A right away. And that's not what was going on that day. My family was done with me. They were going to throw me out. They couldn't even look at me when they were talking to me. You know, where you're talking to them and you're just talking to the side of their face and they just will not even make eye contact with you because they're so done. And uh, I played the recovery card. Was not sincere about it. Begged, cried. Please don't throw me out. Please, I got nowhere to go. I'll go to AA and everything. You know, like, wow, what could be more sincere than that? And my sister said to me, she goes, you know what? We'll see how it goes. And it's not like they really believed I was going to get sober. My first two weeks in Alcoholics Anonymous, my family was taking me to AA and picking me up from AA. You know what that makes you feel like when you look the way I do and you're 31 years old and you get in your older sister's car at the end of the night in the passenger seat and she's driving you home. She goes, so, Donald, what'd you learn in AA tonight? <laughs> I walked into the Simi Valley Alano Club. There were a bunch of old-timers holed up in there with a few dusty copies of the big books. They didn't get a lot of new guys in there, and they jumped on me like a chicken on a June bug. They were just all over me. They were thrilled to see me. I don't remember much about my first meeting, but I do remember my second meeting. I walked into my second meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and a big guy named Lou I walked up to me, and he had a little guy with about a buck fifty bald head, wire rim glasses standing next to him. And Lou said, hey, Don. This is Mark. Mark's going to be your sponsor. And I said, hi, Mark. And Mark said, hold on. And we started a journey in Alcoholics Anonymous. And Mark sat me down in the uh, coffee table of the uh, Simi Valley Alano Club. And he started talking to me about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he started talking to me about sponsorship. And he asked me some very interesting questions. He asked me if I was willing to go to any length for victory over alcohol. Well, I'm not a dummy. I know what the right answer is. But of course. And he told me something that I liked right away. He said, you know what, Don, I'm not going to ask you to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous that I'm not doing myself, which sounded very reasonable. Until I found out he went to 14 meetings a week. Never said no to an AA request. And his idea of a good time is when one of you hits a rough part in the road, he goes down to the local Denny's about 2 a.m. and he'll sit there all night if he has to talk you through it. He used to say that the extent that I'm willing to be inconvenienced for my fellow alcoholic, that's the extent that I walk with God. I thought, terrific, I got a spiritual zealot on my hands. And he got me busy in Alcoholics Anonymous, absolutely busy. I was going to go to 14 meetings a week that he was going to choose. I would have commitments at all those meetings. I would either be setting up or cleaning up or making coffee. He didn't care what I did, but he said, you're going to be doing something. He goes, gratitude's in action around here, Don. He goes, and you know, if you're lucky enough to stay sober, you're going to see people walk up the podiums and walk up to the front of the room. You're going to see them celebrate anniversaries and birthdays. And they're going to talk about how grateful they are. And they're going to talk about what a wonderful program this is. And you're going to see them walk right out the door without helping with the cleanup or the setup. You're going to see them walk right out the door and not help with the new man. He goes, you're far too sick for that. He goes, you're going to get busy around here. And he did. But i got to tell you, he kept... He kept the terms fairly easy on me. You know, my first 30 days, all he wanted me to do was be in these meetings and do these commitments and read that book. And, you know, when you're new, they tell you, read the book, read the book, read the book, read the book, you know. And uh, I'm not working, so I'm reading the book, reading the book, going to meetings. I'm starting to quote the, <laughs> quote the book in meetings. I tell you, I got about 30 days, and the old-timers are saying, stop reading the book, stop reading the book, stop reading the book. And I'll tell you, there were some old-timers that kind of, you know, these are the kind of interesting guys, you know. Like, you know, you, you, you're new and you're an Alcoholics Anonymous and you're trying and you're insane, you know, and you, you quote something out of the book and some, some old-timer after me he says something cute, like, you know, you can teach a parrot to talk, you know. And, uh, and, I, and I'm grateful that the old-timers have swooped me up and took me along with them. You know, they, did, they didn't make fun of my enthusiasm, you know what I mean? They didn't piss on my fence. I'd walk up to these guys and I'd go, man, you'll never guess what it says on page 77. And they knew what it said on 77. My God, they'd been sitting around drinking coffee, reading page 77 for 25 years. They knew what it said. You know what they say to me? They go, no, Don, what does it say? They let me tell them what it said on page 77. These guys saved my life because they let me participate in my own recovery. 
they didn't let me experience the wonder of discovering the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And they didn't tell me what it meant. They tell me what they read it with me. And they asked me what that made me feel. And they asked me what I identified with. And they shared with me openly and honestly about what they identified with. Because you see, what saved my life in Alcoholics Anonymous, see, AA is not a self-help program. You know, this isn't Tony Robbins. This isn't about the big iron or living in the big house or making the big money. That may happen to some of us, but it doesn't happen to all of us. And that's not what this thing was about. If that was what it was about, I couldn't have made it here. Because I would go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous when I was new, and men were just happy with what had happened in their sobriety. And I understand that today because I'm 15 years sober. And they would talk about that new house they got and that promotion they got at work. And they'd talk about paying back the IRS and having that extra money. And they'd be so proud and happy with themselves, and they'd have liked to kill me. You see, I can't do those things when I'm new. Those things don't make me hopeful. They scare the hell out of me. But every now and then I'd catch a break. I'd sit in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, an open meeting, and the man would share openly and honestly about his day. He'd say, I got up this morning, my head was in the corner, and it was waiting for me. And it was just sitting there doing push-ups, looking at me. And when it saw I was awake, it said, oh, good, you're up. Let's talk. You're a loser. You're never going to stay sober. Who are you kidding, you know? And he goes, and I shook that off, and I told my head to shut up, and I got in the shower, and I took a shower. And I went to that job that I hate. You know that job I told you guys about last week where I'm going to kill my boss? Well, I talked to my sponsor. He says, if I kill my boss, he won't sponsor me. So I can't kill my boss. And I went to work, and I did what my sponsor said. I gave him a dime's work for dime's pay, and all day long I said, I hate my job, I hate my job, I hate my job. If I can just make it to the meeting night, if I can just make it to the meeting night, if I can just make it to the meeting night. And I got through that day, and I didn't kill my boss, and then I came home, and I got a quick shower, and I changed my clothes, and I ran down to the clubhouse, you know, and I saw my sponsor here tonight, and we talked a little bit about what's going on, and now I'm sitting here with you, and I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and i got to tell you, I'm feeling better. And that's the guy that saved my life in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's the guy that knew how I felt when I was new. He knew about the insanity. See, something happens to me every time I get sober, and it happened in Alcoholics Anonymous. All the years that I tried to get sober before I came to AA, and I didn't do it under the bright lights of AA, the same thing happens when a guy like me puts down the drink. The race is on. And it's like somebody fires a starter's pistol, and the race is on. And the race has always been the same. It's between my recovery and my alcoholism. And I'll tell you, when I was out there on my own you know, trying to run that race, it wasn't much work for King Alcohol. He let me get a little bit of a lead, and he'd just come up and take me out. But in Alcoholics Anonymous, I had something new. I had a sponsor. I had a home group. I had meetings I would attend on a regular basis. And we were going to make it a fight this time. But that race was still on. And every day, and just because I'm 15 years sober, it doesn't mean that the race is on. I'll tell you what, if I slack off my spiritual program of action, I can feel King Alcohol starting to breathe down my back again. We are never cured of this thing. We have that daily reprieve. And they taught me that when I was new. And I make it to 30 days in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm so proud of myself. And I know there's people here, and we got Alan on here today, and people always ask, you know, when does this thing work? How long does it take to work? When does it repair the family? We don't know. The story's different for everybody else. But I'll tell you what happened in my home. I got sober in the same house I finished drinking with. I lived in the house with my sister for two years before I left that home with two years of sobriety. And when I came home with 30 days from Alcoholics Anonymous, my sister had baked me a cake and she put a candle in it. And she said, you know, in Southern California, when you get a year of continuous sobriety, they bake you cake and they put a candle in it. And you blow it out and you sing happy birthday to it. And my sister said, uh, 30 days for you is like a year for anybody else, I'd imagine. So, uh, <laughs> and she had tears in her eyes. And I blew out the candle and we cried and we held each other. And in 30 short days, we went from my sister couldn't look at me and she was talking to me to where she baked me a cake. Because you see, the hope that Alcoholics Anonymous had put in my life in 30 short days, I had brought home with me in my eyes and I had put into her life. And she had never been to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and she had never read your book. And she didn't understand your steps, but she had her own God. And there was something she saw in my eyes that gave her hope. And in 30 days, she knew before I did that maybe it was going to be okay. 30 days sobriety, I'm sitting in a meeting and I find out. I'm listening and this one guy talks about, he's sharing one night, he says he's talking about an AA bum. This guy's an AA bum. So I go up to my sponsor after the meeting and I go, well, what's an AA bum? And he goes, well, an AA bum's a guy that don't have a job, but he goes to a lot of meetings, so he sounds real spiritual. And I thought, where do I sign up? The next night, my sponsor comes up to me and he goes, by the way, um, we work in this group. Any particular reason uh, you don't have a job? 
And you know, in 30 short days, I'd grown to really love this man, have some respect for this man. So I told him the truth. If I had known his reaction, I probably would have lied to him, i got to tell you. And I said, gee, Spots, I don't have to get a job. I'm collecting unemployment. <laughs> you want to piss your sponsor off, say something like that when he works 50 to 60 hours a week, when he's paying back the IRS, when he's doing all the things that a good man does in Alcoholics Anonymous. He got so angry. It was the first time I'd ever seen him mad. It was really kind of curious. He got so angry he couldn't talk. It was almost like he had a screen and everything that came on the screen was inappropriate. He'd go, ah, I can't say that. And he just kept... He kept starting and stopping. Ah, ee, oh. And finally he kind of stammered out, well, is there any reason other than laziness that you can't go to work? And I thought about it. No. <laughs> so we sat down to plan my financial future, my work life. So I gave him my resume, and I showed him how I worked in the aerospace industry, and I made all this money, and a few contacts left, and I said, you know, I could probably pull a few strings and get in somewhere and start making some real money, because we got to make those amends spots like I had any intention of paying the money back. And he looked at all that, and he said, no, no, no. There's no, Don, for you, we need something humbling. Because, you know, you go back to work, and you make the big money, then your ego won't be smashed, and then you'll uh, drink again, and you'll die, and it just won't matter. So I see here you've never worked with your hands. And I go, nope, barely know which end to hold a hammer. He goes, interesting. Next, next day he walks in and he tells me he got me a job as a laborer on a framing crew. Okay. Now I'd love to tell you some spiritual story about at that point I found out that my life's calling was to work with these. And nothing could be further from the truth. I was terrible at that job. I was awful. Let me tell you how bad I was. I had a nickname on the job site, The Bleeder. <laughs> So now I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous, two meetings a night. I'm working full-time at a job I'm really no good at. And I'm beginning to wonder about this sponsorship thing. And I'm talking to my sponsor about my big problems, because i got big problems, you know, and I give, him the, I give him the punch list, you know, the newcomer punch list of trouble. You know, I'm 80 grand in debt to the IRS. I've just gone back to work after a year and a half. i got warrants for my arrest in two counties. I've never had a checking account. I haven't had a valid driver's license in 10 years. I'm a loser. And these things are taking away all my sleep. And I, I just got to get these things taken care of. And I don't know what to do first. And he told me I was wrong. I said, you're wrong, guy. Because you think these are your problems? I go, yeah, I think they're fairly significant. I said, you're wrong. You only got one problem. He goes, I'll keep it simple for a guy like you. See, you suffer from a disease called alcoholism. And what that means is you got something that wants to kill you slowly and take a large bite out of anyone that has the misfortune of caring about a loser like you. And we'll let you know when these other things are problems. What I heard was, I didn't have to pay back the IRS. <laughs> Found out I was wrong about that, too. Sponsor came up to me when I was about four months sober. He said, we're going to go to jail, or we're going to go to court. And that, that's no big deal in Alcoholics Anonymous. We always go to court. You know, we're AA members. We're always standing up for somebody, supporting somebody, waving goodbye to somebody. You know, it's just a... Normal thing in AA, you go to court. And I said, well, who are we going for? He says, oh, we're going for you. It's a typical newcomer thing. Me? They don't even know where I'm at. <laughs> and, he, and he said, you know what? If you're going to live free, you're gonna, if you're going to live sober, you got to live free of this stuff. And we need to start cleaning up some of your wreckage. You know, you, you need to become a citizen. And you can't walk around. You know, there's warrants for your arrest. You're a criminal. That's what we call it in society now. You know, and I tried to explain and rationalize and justify why it was okay, and lots of people had warrants. He wanted nothing of it. And he knew I had a day coming up that I was going to be off of work, and he said, be out in front at 8 a.m. We're going to court. And I didn't sleep at all that night. I'm trying to figure out, what did I do to piss him off? You know, I've done everything the guy's asked me to do, and he's, he's throwing me in jail. I can't believe this. And I go out in the morning, and there he is waiting in his truck, and I get in his truck, and i got to tell you, he was in the best mood I've ever seen him in. He's smiling. He's whistling, and we're driving along, and he finally says, you know what, Don? When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was in a lot of trouble. Now you're in trouble. This is better. (laughs) (laughs) 
If you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, you want to know why we're so damn glad, happy to see you. That's why. But you only got to go through it once. That's what he told me, and that's been my experience. And we went into court, and the same thing happened in both the courtrooms. We had to show up, and, you know, you get your name on the docket. You wait a couple hours. You're standing there in your cheap Salvation Army suit trying to look like a citizen, and they finally call your name. And the judge rustles the paperwork and says, You're late. Four years. <laughs> And they asked for an explanation. And what came out of my mouth wasn't my words, it's what my sponsor said to say. And I squared my shoulders and I filled my lungs with air and I looked that judge right in the eye and I said, Your Honor, until four months ago, I was drinking myself to death on a daily basis and I've been fortunate enough to become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and I haven't had a drink in four months. And I'm here through sponsored direction to clean up the wreckage of my past. And whatever the court deems necessary for that to occur, I will do so willingly. <laughs> You know, because, <laughs> uh, you know, all night long I've been laying in bed with a vision of a judge grabbing a gavel going, we've been waiting for you, boy, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I'm grandiose. It's only a big deal because it's happening to me. <laughs> and I didn't skate. I didn't, I, but I didn't go to jail. I had to pay back a, a ridiculous amount of money, and I had to do an obscene amount of community service at the Salvation Army and the, Simi Valley. I, I did so much community service there that when I was done, they threw me a party. <laughs> and you know, you think the gift would be that I started to get some of that wreckage that was in that cart I was pulling out of there, you know, a little bit of the wreckage of my past cleaned up, you know, start to feel a little bit better, a little bounce in my step, a little glint in my eye. And that's true, and that's only part of the gift. But the real gift is I walked into a situation with a man I call sponsor, absolutely convinced that he did not have my best interests at heart. And a short time later, I walked out of that same situation thinking, you know what? I don't know everything. And for a guy that did it with smoke and mirrors and never asked for help and never wanted anybody to know I don't have all the answers, that was huge for me. And that was the beginning of a surrender because a surrender for me in Alcoholics Anonymous has always been incremental. And it's always been day to day. And my level of surrender seems to completely correlate with my level of serenity. And the day, on that day, my level of surrender was real good. And I was able to start doing some things in Alcoholics Anonymous. But being new in AA, it's funny how quickly we forget our victories and how quickly we forget our pain. My pain has no memory. You know, six months before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was dying from alcoholism. I was on the streets. I was breaking and entering. I was doing strong arm robberies. I was doing a lot of stuff I'm not proud of just to keep alcohol in my system. Six months later, I'm sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've got my warrants cleaned up. I'm working on a daily basis. I'm starting to become a citizen. There's hope and love alive in my house and my family's eyes again, and I'm losing my gratitude. And my sponsor's telling me my problem is that I'm not staying in the moment. I keep flying out in the future, or I'm back in the past in remorse. And he says that has everything to do with the fact that at six months sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, I won't write my four step. He's telling me that it's time to write my inventory, and I will not do it because I don't think it applies to me. And I come up with all the justification and all the rationalization, and I have all the self-knowledge. What good is it going to do to put it down on paper? And if God is almighty and all-powerful, well, he already knows anyway. And why do I have to share it with another person? I mean, I've seen you guys. I'm not that impressed. And I'm belligerent, and I'm not going to write my fourth step. And I start to die from the disease of, alcoholics and, of alcoholism in the halls of Alcoholics Anonymous sober. And it starts to kill me. And I can't sleep at night. And I start to lose my gratitude. And the sponsor says, you're not in the moment. You never will be until you write your fourth step and share it in your fifth step with me or somebody of your choosing. You're always in the future, Don, and worry, or you're always in the past and remorse. Worry and remorse, worry and remorse. But, the few, but the, everything right now, Don, in the moment, it's cool. Right now, Don, you and I standing here in the clubhouse, is there anything wrong? And I say, no, there's nothing wrong. But, you know, I got that thing. He goes, see, you just went into the future. You can't stay here with us, Don, and if you can't stay in the moment, you're never going to be okay. Stay in the moment. What the hell is he talking about? What's he talking about? i got a head like a beehive. I can't sleep at night. What's he talking about? I make it to six months sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm done. I'm going to two meetings a night. i got commitments at every meeting. I'm doing everything I've been asked to do in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm crazier than I've ever been in my life, and I'm dying from the disease of alcoholism in the halls, and I'm done. I quit. I don't want anything to do with this. I'm getting drunk. If i got to resign, if i got to sign something, fine. Show me where to sign. I'm gone. It's a Friday morning, I get up, and Fridays were always the worst. I always got up at 4.30, I'd make my, my little lunch of cheap meat sandwiches and my little playmate, and I'd put my framing bags on my shoulders, and I'd walk 45 minutes down the hill from my sister's house, 
to where I got picked up to go to a framing site where I would bleed all day, where I would come home, and I get to go to two more meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and hear people talk about the solution that I could only intellectualize, but I couldn't feel in here because I hadn't done the work. I could just tell you why it wouldn't work for me, but I hadn't taken the action. And Fridays were always the worst because I was so tired. And I got up that Friday that I was quitting Alcoholics Anonymous that night, and I started walking down that hill, and there was a sadness and a stillness in the air. There's a stillness in the air everywhere in the world at 4.30 in the morning, but there was a sadness with it that morning because I was leaving AA, and it was one more thing that didn't work for me in my drinking. Damn it. And I'm sad, and I'm walking along, and nobody's out, and it's still dark, and then I saw them. And they're four or five houses away. And there's two Rottweilers. Big dogs, 90 pounds. And they're doing the things that 90-pound Rottweilers do when they get out of the neighbor's house, you know. It's 4.30 in the morning. They're chasing each other over hedges and rolling on their back in the grass. And i got to tell you, as down as I was, as sad as I was, as depressed as I was, I saw those dogs, and for just a moment, they lifted my spirits. And then they saw me. <laughs> and they looked at each other. And they looked at me, and they looked at each other, and they charged me. And I started screaming like a six-year-old girl, ah! And I dropped my framing bags and my little Playmate lunchbox, and I'm thinning them off like a matador, and they're coming at my feet. And they're breaking off, and I'm running backwards down the hill, and they're coming around me. I'm like, oh, my God, they're flanking me. They're flanking me. And I'm running backwards, and they're coming up. Okay. In hindsight, I was of such service to these dogs. Because they were having a ball. I mean, they were shoot, they were just right on my ankles. I, 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 I just, let's see how high he jumps this time. And I'm clearing edges, and I'm running. This goes on for like a half a mile down the hill. So they're just worn out, and they run back up the hill to go home. And I'm at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> and now I'm not leaving AA. <laughs> Not at least until I talk to my sponsor and tell him the latest tale of woe that I have. So I make it to work. I hook up with my sponsor, and I tell him the whole story in like eight seconds. It was amazing. They were huge. They had giant teeth, and they chased me, and I ran, and I thought I was dead. And I thought they were going to eat me. They didn't get me. And I tell him the whole story, and he listens to the whole thing patiently. And he doesn't miss a beat. I get done, and he goes, well, I bet you're in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> And my sponsor was like the king spiritual guy in the world. He could put a spiritual spin on anything. And he said, you know what, Don? I know God loves you very much. And I hope he doesn't have to send any more Rottweilers after you to prove it. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I used to spend a lot of time talking with my sponsor because I hear weird stuff in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was in a meeting once and I heard a guy say we were the chosen. You know what that meant. Didn't like the sound of it. I heard other people say they were here by God's grace, and I said, it oh, sounds good, but I had a problem with that. You see, when I was 23 years old, a guy named Billy, who was my best friend in the world, and I were doing a lot of drinking, serious drinking, manly drinking, and Billy got up and said goodnight. It was about 2.30 in the morning, and he got his Yamaha 650 shaft drive motorcycle, and about a quarter mile from my house, he drove headfirst into a telephone pole and killed himself. And me and the rest of the guys were so ashamed that Billy died that way, we didn't even show up in the funeral because we couldn't with his mother in law and we just drank that afternoon with his dream and talking about what a good guy Billy was. He used to die and he loved to do it. Ride motorcycle. We didn't talk about what he was doing that he didn't have a choice in. He was drinking whiskey the way Billy and I drank whiskey. So when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous and you tell me I'm chosen and you tell me I'm here by God's grace, I got to tell you, I don't want nothing to do with the God that is going to let Billy go out like that and give me a shot. And I talked to my sponsor about that and that's why sponsorship is so important for a guy like me to help me untangle that stuff that's so confusing for me. That stuff I don't know how to trust. I don't have the, the information to work through that. you gotta, you got to put it in words that are going to allow me to stay here another day so I don't have to drink. Allow me to stay one more day and enjoy the gift of sobriety. My sponsor allowed me to do that because he told me, he said, look, Don, when we're out there and we're running and gunning, he goes, we, God can't touch us. We're off the path. He didn't turn our back, his back on us. We turned our back on him, and we're off the path. When you come into Alcoholics Anonymous and you sit down and you say, I'm an alcoholic, welcome to the tribe. It's very easy to get in these things. And when you hit your knees in the quiet of your room at night and you say, please, God, please, God, don't make it like all the other times. Take away the obsession, please. God hears that prayer and he lifts that obsession for us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. But he always does. 
And when he says, I don't want to drink no more, please don't make it like that. Show me how to live. Show me what I need. God's going to do whatever he does to get your attention, but he's a loving God. And he's going to take his time. And he's not going to hurt you. And he's going to send you little tiny hints from heaven to get your attention. And those hints are going to come down. They're going to come down so gently at first, it's going to be so easy to discard them. And we've all had those little hints. They come down, they feel like a feather coming down, don't they? And they land on your shoulder. And you have that thought in your head, and you just brush it aside, and you say, I'm not saying I'm sorry. And I'm not taking a commitment at that meeting. And everybody cheats on their taxes once in a while. And all this justification and rationalization with these gentle nudges from my Creator to tell me that maybe I'm not doing things the way that He would want me to do them. But He's a loving God, and I made a commitment with Him, and He honors His commitments, I'm telling you. And I ask for help, and I don't think He really cares what He has to do to get my attention, but He'll start gently. But my experience in the 15 years I've been in Alcoholics Anonymous, when I get off the path and I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be, eventually it'll feel like a brick fell from heaven and hits me square in the head. And then I will be on my knees and I will be saying, I surrender. And I will be saying, I will do whatever you want me to do. And it's funny how much pain it has taken me sometimes in my recovery to make that kind of surrender about the things that have happened. I made it through my first couple of years in Alcoholics Anonymous. I changed home groups. And I got a new sponsor. I started doing more service work in Alcoholics Anonymous. And my life started to get a little bit better on the outside. I made my amends. And the interesting thing about making the amends when I got to that part of the process was, you see, what I bring to the game naturally without God's help is the same thing all human beings bring to the game without God's help. See, I run my whole life based on my instincts, my intellect, and my emotions. And that's what I've always used to run my life. And without God's help, those things have always failed me. You know, they've always let me down eventually. They work for a lot of the normal stuff in my life, but for my alcoholism, those things are poison. They're just killing me. And when I made the amends, I, went, I did the process just like the book talks, and I sat down with my sponsor before I had made every amends, and I would go to my family, and I was completely convinced on how I had damaged them. And I would sit with my family, and I would talk about the things I had done, and I would ask them what I could do to make it right. And then I would ask them, is there anything you want to tell me? I really need to know how you feel about this. And you don't have to tell me right now. I can come back and we can talk about it because I, I know maybe you haven't had time to think about it. But I really want to know. And it was one of the biggest gifts I've gotten in sobriety, that part of the amends process where I really ask, I really want to know how I hurt you. Because what they said to me I would have never guessed in a million years. And they talked about the phone ringing after 11 o'clock at night and knowing it was somebody calling to say I was dead. They said they never cared about the money. They said they never cared about the stolen cars. They never cared about the missed anniversaries or the Christmas parties. They said that was inconvenient and it made us mad. But we knew you were dying. And you don't know what it's like to love somebody as much as we loved you and know that you were going to die and there was nothing we could do for you. And I was lucky enough in a couple of years to start hanging out with some Al-Anons and going to some Al-Anon meetings as a casual observer of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started to hear some things that helped me in my amends from attending Al-Anon uh, meetings. And if you haven't made your amends yet and you're having trouble with those family amends, I can't encourage you enough to go to an open meeting of Al-Anon as a casual A observer and let them know why you're there and let them know you're there to learn. And those people will help you. And they taught me about what I need to do and they taught me how I can go in there and I can help my family. And I've made those family amends and they've been so powerful to me. But one amends, i I got to tell you, I'm a, <laughs> my wife will tell you this, I'm the cheapest guy on the planet and I'm proud of that. So when I finally had a few nickels to rub together and my sponsor said, it's time to start making some of those big financial amends, you know, I had to take on the IRS. I owed the IRS 80 grand. And I wasn't going to pay him back. I, I thought, you know, hey, I'm sorry. Won't do it again. You know. And I'll tell you, I owed money to everybody and I started making amends. I entered into a payment agreement with the IRS of $100 a month, which wouldn't even cover the interest on what I owed. And I'll tell you, when you write them that first check and you write it out, $100, and you think to yourself, oh, good, 79900 to go. But there's a funny thing about the amends. You see, I didn't, I didn't do the amends to get out of trouble with the IRS. I wasn't taught that that's why we do it. I didn't do the amends to my family so they would like me again. I didn't do my inventory process. The steps for me have been this. The steps have been the way for me to finally get in touch with who I am and realize how important it is that I get away from myself. I have not tried to metamorphosize into anything. You see, the first step was easy for me, and I want to just talk about the steps briefly, and I'm going to stop, and I'll tell you what's happened to me with the steps. 
I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and I take the first step and I think that I've already done it by the time I get here. And people will tell you that in meetings. My sponsor said no. He says, just because you raise your hand in the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and say you're alcoholic, that's not what we talk about. We talk about admitting to our innermost selves. And he sent me home that night. He said, no TV, no radio. You sit, you get quiet, and you think about this thought and no thought other than this. I'm an alcoholic. And you just keep saying that over and over in your head, and then you call me after about 20 minutes. And I sat there, and I thought to myself, okay, sounds silly. I'm an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. Every time I said it, it seemed to get more powerful, and it seemed to draw all these memories along with it. And I got to taste the failure, and I got to taste the heartache. And I called my sponsor 20 minutes later, and I said, man, I'm in a lot of trouble. And he said, now you get the first step. He said, the first step, as much as anything, is you got to understand that you are dying. And this thing wants nothing less than to take you out, because if not, you're not going to do that second step. Why would you come to believe in a power greater than yourself could restore you to sanity with that first drink's concern? And we took that first drink insanity angle on the second step. We didn't take all the crazy things I thought and what I did. He said, those are character defects. We're not going to bring your character defects into the second step. We're going to talk about the insanity of the first drink. And then we went into the third step. And I made that decision to turn my will and my life, my thoughts and my actions over the fear of God. And I'll tell you, the cornerstone of my recovery today, 15 years old later, is one question and the actions based on the answers to the one question. And the one question is, what would God have me do? It's the cornerstone of Alcoholics Anonymous. I do the amends. I do 4 and 5. I do 6 and 7. I do 10, 11, and 12. So I have the ability to ask one question. What would God have me do? And God gives me the power to take the actions based on that answer. That's it. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a new purpose. I have a primary purpose. To stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. It's not about me anymore. It's one question. What would God have me do? And I don't have the power to answer that question. I don't have the power to take the action that the answer to that question will produce in me. And I don't even have the power to honestly take that information and know when it's not my self-will dressing up as God's will. And that's why I have a sponsor. And that's why I'm, I'm completely transparent with him. He knows what goes on in my life. So I have the ability to take these answers that I get about a program called Alcoholics Anonymous and the loving God I found here and bring them into my life on a day-to-day -day basis. When I was seven years sober, I have a wonderful life today. You need to hear this. The reason I have a wonderful life is because I have been wrong about everything. I have been wrong about everything for 15 years. For 15 years, I have thought I knew what was going to happen, and something else happened. For 15 years, I thought my sponsors were wrong, and they turned out to be right. For 15 years, I didn't want this to be the answer because I knew it wouldn't work and has continued to work and my life has continued to get better on the inside where I really live. But I'll tell you what, I'm an alcoholic and i got an ego like anybody else. And me and my wife, we got married, we paid back the money, she paid off the student loans, I paid back the IRS. What good little AAs are we? And we bought a house and I went and told nobody in Alcoholics Anonymous what my ego felt about buying that house. And my ego felt like my reward. My reward. Big loser like me gets a house in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and suddenly I turned AA into a self-help program. But I was wrong, and God has a, has a great sense of humor. And 30 days after we moved into that house, I went and got a call from her father, her estranged father. And we found out that he was dying from cancer. And he had six weeks to live, and they wanted to put him in hospice care. And she cried to me and said, I don't want him to die in a warehouse with strangers. And she became the greatest example of Alcoholics Anonymous I've ever seen because we brought that man home into our house, and I hated that man with everything I had. That was a man that when my wife had had her own life-threatening illness, had called him up because her sponsor said she had to try to invite him into her life, and he wrote her a letter back saying, what do you expect after your kinky lifestyle? I don't have any feeling for this man. We're going to bring him home to our house because it's what Alcoholics Anonymous would have us do. When my wife and I got married, she invited her father to come to the wedding and give her away. And he said, you know what? I like our relationship just the way it is. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to meet him. I'm not coming to the wedding. I don't want this guy at all. But he's dying, and my wife's crying. And sure, we're Alcoholics Anonymous members. We'll bring him home. So we bring him into the house. And he's in the hospital bed, and we got a nurse there during the day, and we're trading off meetings. And my wife is the greatest example of Alcoholics Anonymous I've ever seen. She had every reason to be resentful, every reason to hate this man, and all she did was weigh on him hand and foot. And she loved him, and she washed him, and she bathed him, and gave him anything that he wanted. 
and I took turns, and she'd go out at night, and I'd sit with them at meetings, and I'd wash them, and I'd bathe them, and I'd feed them, and I'd give them anything I want. And inside, I thought about this pain, this hate that I had for the man, this resentment I had, and I felt like a spiritual pony. Everything Alcoholics Anonymous had given me to that point, everything he had taught me, I guess it wasn't real because I couldn't do it. And I called my sponsor up and I said, it's tearing me apart. I got nothing for this guy. I got nothing. He goes, how are your actions? I go, my actions are clean. I'm showing up. I'm loving the guy. I'm doing it as much as I can. But inside, I could care less. I got nothing for him. I got nothing but resentment. Why does it have to be so hard? The sponsor told me he didn't know, but maybe I'd find out somewhere in the process and just keep on with the actions. One night, my wife went to a meeting. He had been quiet all day. It was about two weeks before he died. And all of a sudden, there was the battle cry, John, Jesus, you know. And sleep all day and wait till she leaves. The door closes, and I'm on duty. And I walk into the bedroom, and somehow, in his weakened state, he's skin and bones, you know, at this point, you know, he's riddled head to toe with cancer. He's dying. He's on morphine. Somehow he's pulled himself up and he's sitting on the end of the bed. I couldn't believe he could do it. He's patting the bed next to him. He wants me to sit down. I can't even talk at this point. I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, he wants me to sit down with him. And I think about you and I think about Alcoholics Anonymous and what would AA do? And I go, okay, and I sit down next to him. And he puts his head against my shoulder and I'm stiff as a board and he's stiff as a board and he's breathing real rough and I'm like, oh, God, what do I do with Alcoholics Anonymous? And all your faces are in front of my head. And I'm thinking about everybody who's ever showed me kindness. Like, what do I do? What do I do? And I take my arm and I just run it down his back. I think, that's a loving action. This is good. This is good. And I'm thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm thinking about how much I hate this guy. And I'm dropping my hand down his back. And his breathing starts to settle down. And every time my hand goes down his back, his breathing evens out a little bit more. And his head drops into my chest. And I'm thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm thinking about all the kindness, and I'm thinking about how you loved me when I couldn't love myself, and I wasn't lovable, and I was a wretch. And it seemed like every time I ran my hand down his back, just a little bit of the resentment went out, and just a little bit of compassion came in. And I ran my hand down his back for about a half an hour, and he fell asleep in my arms. And I thought about you, and I thought about Alcoholics Anonymous, and I thought about what really drives this thing, which is God and his love. And I thought about how... I need to love him. And I asked God to come into that room, and I asked God to remove my resentment. And I didn't do it because I wanted to be better, and I didn't do it because I didn't want to be. I wanted it because I didn't want anything between me and him and God. And 20 minutes later, when he fell asleep in my arms, and I was able to lay him back and get up and walk out of that room, whatever was wrong between us was gone and never came back. And you see, and I thought that was about me. See, I talked to my sponsor after he died, and I said, isn't that great? Isn't that great that God was there right on time? He gave me a chance to get over this resentment before he left. He said, Jesus, Don, you think you so dumb you even got that wrong. He goes, that? He goes, you think loving him and letting him go out knowing he was loved, you think that was your gift to him, buddy? That was his gift to you. You see, I'm always wrong and I'll call it tonight. Life's a funny thing. All the things I worry about never happen. And all the bad stuff that does happen to me, I never see it coming. So why worry? I want to thank you for my life. I want to thank you for my sobriety. I am not a perfect person. If you are not sure of that, please feel free to talk to my wife. She will shake her head and say, you have no idea. I am like a sideshow. I am uh, I am an e-ticket. I am uh, I am not boring. I promised her that if she'd marry me, she'd never be bored. She's not bored. She's been pissed, but she's not bored. <laughs> but I want to thank you for my life. I want to thank you for all the good in my life. I want to thank you for giving me a second shot at the game of life. I want to thank you for teaching me how important it is to reach back to the man coming behind me. I want to thank you for teaching me that ag- magic. the magic word is action. I want you to... I want to thank you for the relationship I have with my God today. I want to thank you for all these things that I came in with, thinking that were so valuable, my instincts, my intellect, my emotions. I want to thank you for teaching me that there's no value in those things, that the only thing of real value, the the money that we trade in around here is love. It took me a long time to get that. Thank you for hanging in there with me, and thank you for teaching that to me. That's all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.